Uh, let me ask the question. What is this thing called a knowledge economy? I know that most of you have a fairly good idea about what is this thing uh, and what are the implications and so on. But still, I thought I should <coughs> define it uh, in terms of the gradual development of the concept in the writings of various scholars. Um, I, I quickly review some of the very important writings that gave rise to the concept of knowledge economy. It was Daniel Bell, professor of sociology, Harvard University, famed for his book, The Coming of Post Industrial Society, today in social forecasting published in 1973, who brought our notice, he writes an information-led, service-oriented economy and society. He distinguished this economy as the arrival of post-industrial society with three features as manifested attitudes. Number one, from manufacturing to services. Two, precedence of science based industries and three, the rise of the new managerial class of technical elites with a new principle of practice. Daniel Bell also conceptually differentiated between three aspects of the post First is data or information described in the empirical world. And two, information or the organization of that data into meaningful systems and patterns such as statistical analysis. And last, knowledge as the competence to use information to make judgments. Now, ever since the right by Daniel Bell, several writers constituted the development of the technology society, but they all made a kind of ambiguity between knowledge society and information society. What are the knowledge economy, knowledge society, information economy? notwithstanding the ambivalence between knowledge and information. But Henry Castells, a Spanish sociologist, famed for his studies in information society, communication technology, and globalization, the professor of the Obeta University of Catalonia in Barcelona, he put up in nine. In 1989, his thesis of information economy as city economy or urban economy. He represented it as the informational city, information technology, economic restructuring, and the urban regional process. Now, more or less during the same period, say in 1991, Andrew Feinberg. Uh, Another uh, uh, professor, uh, but a specialist in critical economy of technology, uh, he argued that knowledge economy is nothing but a phase of capitalism. There's no point in talking about various features, this, that, and so on. So he wanted the writers to come to terms with the reality that global economy called capitalism was growing more and more global. Now we will return to Andrew Feinberg's idea a little later uh, because he made other publications subsequently, but his 1991 work itself was classic. 
nevertheless, B.F. Chakka, his name is quite famous because he was the one who popularized the term knowledge economy. Now, taking capitalism as the point of reference, Tracker in 1993 uh, understood the phase of transformation as transformation into post-capitalist society. Now, he used the expression post-capitalist society in a very generic sense. He was one who popularized the expression knowledge economy uh, as a professional in the management science. Meanwhile, several urban economists like Michael E. Porter, uh, a management specialist and economist, and uh, scholars in urban studies like Peter Cook, K. Morgan, Richard Florida, J. Simi, and others, in 1990s, I wrote extensively on this new economy with the explicit feature of information technology. Now he was sticking to Castle's concept of information age, but confined to a small geographic area called the city. So he, uh, 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 not he, uh, Peter Cook uh, called it information city and others focusing on various external features, talked about innovative cluster, intelligent region, learning spot, learning region, uh, and, and uh, in Richard, Florida, and J. Simi, <coughs> you find the economy characterized as knowledge-based competitive city economy. And in terms of society, knowledge-based competitive society in the city. Now, Manuel Castells, who talked about the information age first, came up with a detailed study in 1990s, say, towards the end of 1990s, recognizing the economy as something transcending city space, something going beyond the urban spots, encompassing the whole world and becoming also epochal. He elaborated its features in three volumes with the general title, The Information Age, The Economy, Society, and Culture. In the first volume, published in 1996, he dealt with the rise of the network society. The main title is The Information Age, The Economy, Society, and Culture, but volume one had the special title, The Rise of the Network. And then, in the second volume, published in 1997, he dealt with the power of identity. And in the third volume published in 1998, he dealt with end of millennium, end of millennium. Uh, anyway, literally, knowledge economy means production, consumption, and exchange of knowledge. Because economics, as you all know, uh, basically means production, consumption, and exchange. If it is knowledge economy, then naturally it should be production of knowledge, consumption of knowledge, and exchange of knowledge. It's a system <clears throat> based on intellectual capital, to be specific, scientific discoveries and innovative technology, which represents the dominant economic activity in advanced countries, say developed countries. In the academic sense, knowledge is its explicit and implicit forms codified at the expense of the tacit. A tacit knowledge, as you all know, is a curious kind of knowledge which just cannot be transferred uh, from X to Y easily. It's a kind of skill 
which is perfected over the years and those who struggle to do that need not necessarily be good at it. And tacit knowledge was important in a society before having knowledge codified uh, and systematized. And always that kind of knowledge was called a textualized knowledge. And as you all know, there is quite a lot of difference between knowledge embedded in practice and textualized knowledge that a scholar would transmit to students. And all the students need not necessarily be following even the tenets of codified knowledge. And tacit knowledge only Mayuri professors would be able to deal with because it just uh, wouldn't be get communicated through words. So students will have to work and understand. Students will have to practice and learn. And that is the field supposed to be known as engineering field. And inevitably, uh, the students getting themselves converted into professional engineers. But that's not the situation in the country because you have large number of engineering colleges and they are proliferating engineering graduates. Perhaps one or two out of 100 would become engineers. And you have technology institutions. Uh, if an engineering program is expected to be producing engineers capable of literally the job of engineering, then there is a, an output there called a repair engine or an invented engine. It has something to do with engineering. A technology is relating to process. It is invention of process. It is understanding process. It is practicing process. So if en engineering leads to a product called engine, technology leads to the product called process. Anyway, you do not have many engineers and many technologies among the graduates produced by the institutions and institutions in the country. It's not producing, but generating uh, various replicable uh, practices, not innovative practices. Uh, in the case of knowledge economy, you have people generating original knowledge on the one side, and then people replicating information and information-based practices. So information-based society and knowledge society would be coexisting, but you cannot equate them uh, each other. Information society, for example, is not producing knowledge, but generating, storing, processing, communicating, exchanging, and consuming information or data by using digital technologies. What it demands the most is the tacit form of knowledge essential to operate digital technologies. Uh, arguably, knowledge economy has to be seen as the core of the knowledge-driven economy, the macro field of multiple enterprises of auxiliary nature. Here we should remember that people today are talking about knowledge in terms of information and information in terms of knowledge. It is uh, some uh, kind of ambiguity about it. Uh, one is reminded of what T.S. Eliot asked a long time back. Where is our knowledge lost in information? Or where is our wisdom lost in knowledge? And where is knowledge lost in information? Now people celebrate our age as the age of information. The implicit presumption is whether they mean it or not, perhaps inadvertently, we are not worried about knowledge, but we are obsessed with information. Knowledge economy anyway distinguishes knowledge from information. 
knowledge economy uses knowledge as patentable intellectual property of an enormous exchange value. It is acting as a commodity and as knowledge can generate multiple commodities, it is capital as well. As a side one example, a scientist may discover a new molecule and it has, it has importance as discovery science. But a pharmaceutical industry is interested in exploring the possibility of using the new molecule as a drug or a base of the drug. A new molecule could be used in various ways in a pharmaceutical industry for giving birth to multiple drugs. So that is, that is the, the difference. So you can have knowledge and that can be patented and a, a, a patented knowledge would go to a pharmaceutical industry for the multiplication of drugs, which would mean on the one side knowledge acting as commodity and on the other side knowledge generating multiple commodities. That's the reason why we say in knowledge economy, knowledge is both commodity and capital. It's a potential basis for the production of other commodities. That is the reason why we consider knowledge as capital too. Now, uh, you have in the process a turn considering discovery science something secondary to innovation science or innovative technology something superior to science based on discoveries. Now here we use the this precedence of technological and innovative knowledge uh, making industry something knowledge intensive, establishing, combining scientists, engineers, and information technology workers. It brings uh, knowledge as the raw material of the factory, and knowledge as the product of the factory. This is an interesting phenomenon. Knowledge goes into the factory as product, and then and the industry produces knowledge. Similarly, innovation goes into the making of multiple manufacturers in the industry and the multiple manufacturers put themselves in their turn uh, become raw materials again and then would generate numerous other products. So it's an interesting phenomenon of convergence, convergence of laboratory and industry convergence of scientists and technologies, convergence of science tech hybrid specialists and then the factory bureaucrats. So you find industry as something very curious, industry and laboratory remaining the same, industry and uh, uh, assembly of workers becoming industry as assembly of engineers and and technologies. I'm not saying that there weren't engineers and technologists in industries in the, uh, in the in the commodity manufacturing industry of the early capitalist phase. There were uh, many of them, but now you find even the workers, so-called proletariats, but very sophisticated and highly paid proletariats, also people having tacit knowledge, people having very good expertise in operating digital technologies. We will come back to this question uh, later. But anyway, as uh, in the initial phase of uh, our program, uh, my colleague and comrade uh, expressed the generally shared feeling that knowledge economy is uh, going towards an egalitarian society. Many sociologists and economists today contemplate the onset of 
technology society is a gradual dissolution of the industrial economy and capitalism, triggering hopes about the spread of knowledge and technology, enabling a larger society to mitigate poverty and inequalities, and finally turning society more democratic and equitable. Now this utopian projection is fine. I am not a, a, a taker of this optimism. I have my arguments. Um, <clears throat> I will go into it after a while. Now my first question here is, is it mere rhetoric or real? There are writings, fine. Who are writing these sociologists of what perspective? On what theoretical basis? Why are they characterizing knowledge economy as something highly optimistic? Uh, I take it for rhetoric because one can theoretically access what is real about the economy. Now let me take up the theoretical question. Does knowledge economy represent a new mode of production? A, a social science student and student of history, depending on Marx theory as framework of comprehension, I have to ask this question. Is the so-called knowledge economy a distinct mode of production, intelligible in terms of means, relations and forces of production? As mentioned earlier, Andrew Feinberg, an American professor of philosophy of technology at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, made his theoretical case way back in 1991 for treating knowledge economy as a new version of capitalism. In his critical theory of technology and overview, he has reasserted it uh, in, in various ways. He was taking uh, the process called the globalization of capitalism seriously. And everybody knew that capitalism was meant to be a global economy. And the process that we call development is nothing but the process of incorporation of other developing economies, marginalization of the ordinary livelihoods. And then you find the repercussions of the growth of capitalism in the margins, in the form of destruction of the livelihoods of ordinary people. And then people above them, the largely uh, swollen middle class, incorporation of them in various ways, multiple functions. And above them, <coughs> as entrepreneurs of multiple enterprises, now called coordinating or absorbing them as agents of the major productions. And then competition among multiple industries, are coming to terms with them and then organizing them into corporates, oligarchic corporations. So that is the process uh, that the world has been witnessing for the last several decades, one can say after the Second World War. Uh, we, we find in the work of Andrew Feinberg an analysis of this kind. Now in 1995, he published his well-known book, Technology and the Politics of Knowledge. It's very important. Now here, he examines how knowledge is becoming uh, simultaneously a commodity and capital, and how it is giving a new shape to the capitalist industry. Then he studied modernity and technology, published in 2003, and in, in 2004 he published Community in the Digital Age, Philosophy and Practice. Uh, there are two very important works, quite relevant to our discussion here, uh, were published by him in uh, 2000, uh, yes, in 2002 and then 2011. In 2002, he 
published still this idea intellectual property and corporate confiscation of creativity and this was published in 2002 still the idea intellectual property and corporate confiscation of creativity then in 2011 he published the invisible hand the invisible handcuffs of capitalism how market tyranny stifles the economy by stunning workers it's a it's a big revelation i'll come to that a little later there is take up the first book steal this idea intellectual property and the corporate confiscation of creativity now along with this uh, we have to take up another scholar another marxist political economist feral man uh, who has unraveled how techno capitalist corporations confiscate creativity on the science tech youngsters by using a very complex techno military system of electronic sophistication now i combine perelman studies and andrew feinberg studies and also another scholar who made everything very clear and point blank is scholar called Louis Suarez Villa. Louis Suarez Villa, a political economist and professor of policy theorist in the University of California. And he published in 2009 a book called Techno-Capitalism. Techno-Capitalism, the latest phase of capitalism, which according to him, heavily depict according to him, Uh, is to be understood as heavily dependent on research outcomes and intellectual property for capital accumulation. Uh, Louis Suarez Villa says that he got the idea about the process, process of globalization from Andrew Feinberg and Michael Perelman. But uh, Louis Suarez Villa was first to use the term techno-capitalism. because Perelman talks about the heavy dependence of the economic uh, production of knowledge uh, on science and technology. Similarly, uh, Andrew Feinberg was very clear about the emergence of technology that even information technologies. But he was not able to identify this as this in terms of a new name for the latest phase of capitalism is techno-capitalism, but one can easily read it from his descriptions. But uh, Luis Suarez Villa coins the term techno-capitalism. Uh, his book published in 2009, Techno-Capitalism, a critical, a critical Perspective on Technological Innovation and Corporatism. Uh, he, he says, although Feinberg and Perelman Uh, had not used the term techno-capitalism. Their descriptions, their, I mean, the descriptions in their studies and their interpretations of knowledge economy uh, give us this idea very clearly that capitalism was heralding a, a new phase by turning knowledge itself as its commodity and capital. It's very interesting in two ways for an economist. See, in capitalist industrial development or in the process of capital accumulation, two important issues always created problems. One is the well-known economic law, the law of diminishing returns. And after some time, you find any product losing its market and then there is the application of the law of diminishing returns. And then in the case of capitalism, uh, with periodic intervals, there used to have depressions or recessions, which the, uh, the well-known Marxist political economist Kondrati uh, characterized as wave theory in capitalist development. And this is known today in political economy as Kondrativ cycles or Kondrativ waves. It's a wave of boom 
and wave of depression. Now we call it capitalist recession. And we know that there was a terrific recession in 2008. After that, there hasn't been any recession. Although people have been talking about capitalist recession uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, there was it. Capitalism was very strong and capitalism made miraculously huge profit during the period of COVID. Of course, there was the period of close down and all that, but corporates had enough soon in the form of uh, biotechnology based outputs biotechnology based patents transactions biotechnology based intellectual property transactions and everybody knows about the story of vaccine covid vaccine and the huge trade related to that nowhere in the world at no point of time a situation occurred where every every human being on earth sometimes even animals required vaccination nothing to talk about the huge uh, or amazing kind of consumer group the whole world getting converted into the consumer space as far as villas next book globalization and techno capitalism the political economy of corporate power and technological domination published in 2012 talks about what corporates have been doing after 2008 now after 2008 in various developed countries particularly in europe america and australia you know uh, uh, you, you find people uh, getting the impression that their governments wouldn't be reaching them for providing them support. Instead, the most important concern of the governments would be safeguarding the dominant economy, that means safeguarding capitalism, protecting capitalism, facilitating better accumulation for the retrieval of the capitalist growth point or how to resolve recession. That used to be the question. So in various places, people decided to form groups by themselves. They even thought about uh, transacting through their own norms, bitcoins and uh, various digital uh, uh, digitally enabled uh, transactions. Digitally enabled transactions is records of transactions without depending upon various institutions, offices, and uh, legal systems of government. They all started forming themselves into corporate societies of unusual kind, which is nothing new for uh, a state like Kerala, where you have a constitutionally ordained kind of cooperative societies coming up, local self-government emerging and so on. And uh, that is very strong in Kerala. But during the immediate uh, post-recession of 2008, people were rather withdrawing from the state mechanisms and making life possible through their own ideas, institutions, and practices. And leaving it there, there is an excellent study by uh, a group of economic anthro anthropologists led by Manuel Castells, who I mentioned earlier. The title of the book is Another Economy is Possible. Another Economy is Possible. Now here, uh, now let's get back to Luis Suarez Villa. His third book is Corporate Power, Oligopolis and the Crisis of the State, published in 2015. Now, he focuses on the unquestionably 
inalienably perpetuated power called corporate power. And then it applied to the states wherever they are as crony capitalist states. Now what is happening since 2008 to capitalism? As I have already mentioned, capitalism became oligopolies without serious competition amongst themselves. They always allowed the intermediary level agencies who circulated commodities to compete against one another. That would, that would preserve competition in the market or price balance. But at the same time, you have huge capitalists forming themselves into corporations. And an interesting phenomenon is all the corporates establishing globally giant experimentalist ex establishments. This is what I identified in the initial phase as huge laboratory plus industry combined or huge laboratories themselves, experimentalist establishments themselves becoming industries. Industries producing what? Industries producing knowledge. Industries producing intellectual property. Industries producing patents. And what is the industry doing? Industry is recruiting thousands and thousands of youngsters trained in high power computing. And they are paid very well. But an undertaking is taken from them. An undertaking, signed undertaking from them. That is, I will not have any claim to the intellectual property, uh, the production of which has taken place with the help of myself as well. I will have no claim to patents relating to that intellectual property. Then intellectual property goes to whom? Intellectual property goes to the huge experimentalist establishments are run by the techno-capitalists or corporations, techno-capitalist corporations. And what are these youngsters doing? There is no laboratory as we conventionally understand. These are all high-powered computer operating industry. Computer, uh, high-powered computer software-based operation uh, in, in, in simulation activities. They are simulating and making uh, innovations. All these youngsters are engaged in production of knowledge, but each one of them would produce only a module or two, and it is the business of the supercomputer to make a meaningful assembly of these modules and recognize them as potential new knowledge to be patented. And with the help of, again, high-powered centralized computing, uh, corporates identify the knowledge generated by these youngsters capable of securing patents and the companies sent many such uh, discoveries and inventions to the patenting agency. Now, there are thousands and thousands of patents getting accumulated in the hands of the corporates now, most of which are of crucial importance to people's life. Just remember what happened to vaccine and how America reacted to it. In the first meeting itself, America said, no question of making vaccine freely available to people because it has intellectual property and patent implications. If we capture intellectual property and patents from individual scientists and companies, this would mean highly detrimental to industry, which means highly detrimental to knowledge economy, highly detrimental to 
in knowledge based techno capitalist economy so in the first meeting itself america made it very clear and america withdrew that was not an exception what happened in india we have a, am, I, am i exceeding my time no please go ahead okay uh, are we you are on mute Uh, 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 yeah, sorry, uh, 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 Dr. Yes. you go ahead and you take the time to comfortably finish your thought on the subject. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, that, that gives me uh, some kind of data because I don't have to make a rush about okay? it. So what I was saying is that you have uh, examples right in front of us, but due to lack of understanding about what knowledge economy really means. We don't go into the seriousness of So that's why I cited the American example of their attitude towards uh, yeah. distribution of vaccines. They thought that could be the difficulty. Anyway, now you have all over the world uh, two uh, knowledge producing industries. We also have a chapter on it, biotechnology industry in India, and then the, the bion companies in India. Now we have a very powerful Intellectual Property Rights Act, which gives state enormous power to capture and use intellectual property from the private companies for public good. But uh, in spite of the act, you all know what really happened. It required huge mass reaction against the policy to put a stop to vaccine export and get prime Primacy for the nationwide distribution of vaccine. It happened because of democratic pressure, not because of the goodwill of any uh, any uh, state level ruler or central ruler. State, of course, Kerala was very much uh, committed to it, but you don't find that kind of commitment anywhere in the country not accidentally. It was all because of the uh, chronic capitalist status of the central state mechanism. It is, it is a natural, it is very difficult when the dominant economy is the main uh, force behind every decision taking place. It is natural. Anybody who knows Marx's theory pretty well, Rish, is it audible? Pretty, uh, am I not audible? Yes, audible, audible. Yes. Uh, yes, I was saying that anybody who knows Marx's theory can predictably understand the situation. It is natural that the state would be audible. The state would become uh, just a tool in the hands of the yes, it is. economy. It was all well debated in the past. I would request you to recall how Lenin defined the highest phase of capitalism. He defined the highest phase of capitalism as imperialism, which means imperialist power in the hands of the dominant economy. Rosa Luxemburg taking up various passages from Marx, made it very clear that capitalism would progress and progress, keeping distance from you, keeping distance from bourgeois democracy. Bourgeois democracy is required only to a certain point as far as capitalism was concerned. Now, capitalist development has reached a phase where it wouldn't require any more capitalist support. You know, 
get any more democratic support. Interesting thing is, it is increasingly becoming anti-democratic. It's nothing but what Lenin said by way of the highest, uh, the highest phase of capitalism as imperialism coming true. Now, industries engaged in knowledge production are concentrating on various science and hybrid fields of breakthrough innovations, potential breakthrough innovations, such as functional and structural genomics, DNA barcoding of species, medical biotechnology, agrobiotechnology, biomolecular brain computer interface studies, robotics, graphene engineering, and, and what not. Now, the very single thing, brain computer interface studies, some of the corporates have very heavily invested in this field, anticipating the technological product requirements after 30 years. They are all working hard to have uh, brain computer interfaces. Now you have a, a large number of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality based tools, wearable glasses, and wearable headsets and so on. Do you, do you experience? not just study of epipelago of the ocean. Today, there is deeper ocean which we were not able to penetrate so far. Next to reality and then the artificial intelligence uh, enabled uh, learning devices would help you to penetrate into the impenetrable areas below as well as uh, beyond the atmosphere. But that is the kind of uh, research is going on. And then the attempt is to develop uh, a high focusing kind of internet points. And when you focus on a site, it could get selected and there would be possibility of direct downloading to the neurons. Now, governance of neurons, organization of neurons, and so on, are being tried with the help of nanotech sensors and transmitters. And nanotech sensors would sense the status of neurons, whether neurons would be having required level of serotonin and dopamine and the like uh, neural transmitters, or the various other hormones like endorphins, oxytocins and so on. All these are there in the blood but we have the difficulty today that although they are in the blood they are not available in the neurons. That this has been the weakness of homo sapiens sapiens and therefore various cultural practices have been there. People used to embrace, people used to collectively dance, people used to laugh and amuse and so on. All these were capable of creating a special neurochemical environment in the brain. For example, if one embraces the other, there will be enough oxytocin <coughs> in the neurons. A mother gets maximum oxytocin in the neurons when she milks the baby. Now you have various cultural practices in some places embracing, in some places shaking hands in some places, uh, 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 they, uh, coming together and then rejoicing and so on. All these as long ago without any neuro uh, scientific knowledge, some of the anthropologists uh, 
they are able to predict the biological importance of cultural practices. Now, I don't want to digress to that. What I was saying is that now you have the corporate techno-capitalist industries trying to develop brain-computer interface gadgets which will be tomorrow's requirement. Thousands of young scientists trained in high instrumentation culture, often qualified as the innovators of tomorrow, are all working as sophisticated slaves in the companies of the corporates, the companies which are huge research establishments. These corporates compete with one another in buying patents and intellectual property rights. There are corporates competing against one another and within each corporate setup, you all know there are many companies. Uh, they are all interested in enhancing their market power and to be the first to come up with new products. New products are not just new products as we understand today. New products perhaps capable of erasing the negative gene, gene expressions from the biomolecular profile of a person. It is DNA, it is DNA editing. DNA has the record of what should happen at what age in each individual. Now there are attempts at functional genomics and structural genomics uh, for getting control over DNA and editing it so that at some point of time people will be capable of expensively though a stage where they would remain at the age they would require as healthy, handsome or charming whatever. The Perelman here says that this competition among corporate industries uh, is leading to theft of patented knowledge, infringement of intellectual property rights and the litigations against them galore. And these corporates command huge intellectual assets of amazing exchange value, amounting to as much as four fifths of the value of most products and services in existence today. And that is the level of economy. We, we just cannot predict what would be the price of an intellectual property or a given intellectual property right. Now you, you are familiar with a very well-known example. I would like to uh, remind you of the transaction that took place between Zuckerberg and who uh, designed WhatsApp. Zuckerberg purchased WhatsApp from some seven or eight youngsters who were responsible for the making of WhatsApp by paying 19 billion US dollars, 16 billion in cash and the rest as share. These youngsters never expected that as the possible market price of the product, the intellectual product, the intellectual property that they had. The interesting feature here is that it is the buyer who fixes it is the buyer who fixes the price and that even to the amazement of the maker, amazement of the owner. So techno-capitalist corporates are now, as I said earlier, not disturbed by the law of diminishing returns or the contractive wave theory. They do not face the threat of workers' resistance either because on the one side you have very heavily paid workers. There is exploitation rapacious and cruel, but they are very well paid and therefore this exploitation is unnoticed. What we comrades really know about the tension that the youngsters are facing in the corporate establishments, they are all imposed upon with the targets. They are supposed to be producing patentable knowledge within the given period. It's not that easy. So they are facing a kind of tension that the human beings have never had to experience previously. But it is all unnoticeably sophisticated. 
techno capitalist corporations have entrenched the capitalist juridical political structure turning the state power uh, almost as a system of the corporates for the corporates and uh, by the corporates so democracy is being replaced by this curious system there is a new form of imperialism today known as transnational imperialism based on the global corporate power there is no state power as such it is a power that transcends state power state powers are mere tools now you have an array of highly sophisticated and intrusive technologies you won't have the youngsters capable of organizing themselves and making resistance because they do not know to whom they should resist against whom they should put up their resistance because it's all technologically driven they on fun on on fine morning would receive would receive an electronic letter saying you are promoted as ceo at another point of time they would receive Yes, in the same form, an electronically enabled letter saying that you are not required for the company anymore. You can collect the dues from uh, this particular account. You can click and then sign that. Your entire uh, uh, dues would go into your account. You cannot say this to the team members. led by you cannot have any discussion with the immediate boss because he also is linked up with this kind of an electronically sophisticated setup no doubt we have to see this seriously i am not saying that we have an answer now technological change is that kind of a process you cannot make a choice you are not given a choice it is almost like a house on fire it's like a an island with people lost with an unfinished ship ashore kind of situation on the one side like a house on fire house on fire like situation or an island where people are lost there is an unfinished ship ashore but that ship has to be constructed on say you have to decide to board the ship and then you decide to participate in the completion of the construction of the ship on say that is the kind of emergency situation i am saying this as uh, a, a, an academic policy dealer i am now giving leadership to Uh, colleges in the state for digital enablement they all have to be part of uh, the model learning management system is underway and the state data center will have centralized facility for all these colleges and if a person doesn't like he or she doesn't like that's all there is there is no other consequence rather than a virtual expulsion from service first and then he or she would retire and go but youngsters no choice elizabeth kubler uh she noted uh, some time ago a well known social psychologist she said elizabeth kubler rose that when something new comes in society people deny that so she has a model called dabda model d for denial a for anger b for bargain and d for depression and a for acceptance so that is the situation we all will have to undergo if we resist the uh, rise of technology although it is taking place as an onslaught it is acting as an onslaught on craftsmanship it is 
acting as a major power everywhere. It's creating huge difference between ordinary workers and informed, digitally enabled uh, engineers. They, they constitute the primary workforce today in the industry, remember that. And then the other head load workers and various other workers, they would be in the margin. And here you have a new class which consists of youngsters who do not have any idea about what May Day means, what labor organization means, what this world could achieve, the world of laborers could achieve by way of emancipatory measure what the labor, labor world achieved by way of labor right, they have no idea. They are denied all these things, but they are paid well, and they are living in a very sophisticated condition, but nobody knows that they have 24 hours responsibility to a simulating machine. Machine will call them up, and they would be answerable to any troubleshooting any time. If they get time, they eat, if they get time, they sleep. If they get time, they may do the biological reproductive function. They are almost like robots, and soon robots will come. There will be commingling of robots, and robotics is a major uh, field for protection of intellectual property and acquisition of patents by the corporate establishments. Now, I'm winding up saying, that we have to remember that capitalism hasn't reached its final point. We have no other choice as things go today. Capitalism will reach its final point and sometimes capitalism would perish only along with the earth and the people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, most of the point has gone above my head, and we have heard of capitalism, uh, crony capitalism. Now we have got the corporate confiscation of intellectual creativity and property. So I thought of uh, Dr. Prakash to respond. But uh, Prakash has sent a message to me that let uh, Suresh Kodu respond first. So the, we have in for a difficult uh, time. So I would request uh, Suresh Kodu to come up with a response to this uh, uh, talk. I would only qualify by one, one single word, succinct. Over to you. Suresh Kodu. Kodu, Suresh Kodu is uh, uh, a scientist from uh, Tata Institute. Baba Atomic uh, Research Center. And uh, he is uh, a CEO of uh, an IT company. He is a creative uh, writer, essayist, um, and a very articulate speaker. He is uh, my colleague in the uh, Study Center. And uh, over to you, Suresh. Thank you, Comrade Arvi. Uh, so you can hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, just a correction, not really a Tata Center, but uh, Baba Atomic Research Center. It was a ex former nuclear scientist there. But uh, then transformed, transferred into IT. So uh, again, Good evening, all friends, comrades, Dr. Rajan Gurukul. He has given a wonderful uh, exploration of the topic, uh, uh, deep and drug, uh, the uh, very good uh, uh, analysis and the exploration of what the knowledge economy means and uh, where we are in terms of the state of uh, capitalist mode of production and uh, where we are in the state of the development of uh, productive process. Thanks, uh, Dr. So uh, for me, like uh, as, as uh, someone who is uh, deeply involved professionally in the realm of uh, information technology as an uh, IT professional, 
uh, both from an engineering as well as uh, executive management uh, uh, roles. Let me put a technopolitical perspective to the <coughs> neo-economic order that's largely knowledge oriented, uh, as explained and detailed uh, by the Dr. Mm. Guru Kandri. Mm. So the, the, the continuing transformation of the world economy from the realm of matter and energy, that's what the uh, brick and mortar companies or the industrial economy is about, uh, to the sphere of information. We know that that has been very tremendous and has been affecting pretty much all of the world's population, creating uh, you know, opportunities and challenges. But we also know that it's not uniform, while you know, big, big divide in the world uh, between the countries, some of them who are uh, you know, taking advantage hugely of this advancement, the majority of the world is like uh, lagging like behind. Now, the novelty of the contemporary society. Uh, so, what's the whole thing about this information society? What's new about it? So, the, the novelty is not really that there are networks in the society. They've always been there in some form. 